Welcome, it's Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Mark Takano, he is a member of the United States Congress. And so I want to speak with you about the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. Uh, it's very interesting. If you really dissect what's happening with Obamacare, it's a tale of two cities, I guess you could say, in those 14 states that are operating their own independent websites, they seem to be doing pretty well. Healthcare.gov seems to be struggling a bit, but why is it that we don't hear as much the success stories of those 14 states, including California? Well, I think um, there is a concerted effort um, among uh, some very conservative uh, Tea Party activists um, and interests that want to see this uh, Affordable Care Act fail. And so they're focusing attention on uh, the shortcomings of the federal website. Um, you know, all of the attacks uh, from the Republicans in Congress are fo they're focused on that. I just came out of a science committee hearing uh, recently. Uh, the science committee took jurisdiction over uh, the security of the website, and they were bringing in experts to uh, cast doubt on the security website, and of course... Are they talking about personal information? Personal information, and, and of course, no information, no personal information is actually stored at the website. It's, it's all routing information to the Social Security Administration, where they can verify people's incomes, well, et cetera. What I thought was interesting about the opposition to the Affordable Care Act is, you know, it's one thing to oppose a law, but the law has been passed. Yeah. It's been implemented. But there are groups, um, one of them I understand being operated through the Koch brothers, which is a name we hear often. Yeah. And that group, it, it's literally, it's going to college campuses and it is setting up booths and the campaign is called Opt Out. Mm -hmm. And what they're trying to do is convince young people not to sign up through healthcare.gov or their respective websites. And I just... Again, I'm not taking a position on the Affordable Care Act, but it just seemed quite remarkable to me that that is where the opposition is going, that they're actively working to make sure the law fails once it's already become the law. Yeah, well, of course, uh, Brad, um, as, you, as you might know, the more people who sign up for health care, including young people, right. uh, the more health insurance premiums are but, likely to go down. Go down, right. Um, you know, the bigger the bigger the pool of premiums, uh, and that will happen if more and more people sign up. And the people who want this law to fail because of their ideology, the Koch brothers are libertarians mm. um, who just don't believe in any involvement at all. What, what makes me even more incredulous about the Koch brothers is that really this healthcare reform is about enabling uh, the private market to work. It's about regulating the private market so it works for everybody. And, and so it doesn't exclude people. Right. It doesn't exclude people with pre-existing conditions. The government is not uh, is not operating insurance. They're not operating uh, the private, the individual market for insurance, um, which or is a, the uh, employer market. Or the employer market. So eighty percent, eighty percent of the people get their insurance, their health insurance from employers. Uh, the remaining uh, uh, twenty percent, uh, or the employers, or uh, let's say. Uh, uh, Medicare, Medicare or, or Medicaid. Medi-Cal, right. uh, Medicaid, right. um, but the remaining 20% who need to go to the individual market, um, that, that's where uh, the, the Affordable Care Act is really trying to make a difference. Let's talk about this whole notion of keep your plan. Yes. Now, as a journalist, I will say that it was a bit surprising that President Obama chose to say a few years back, if you like your plan, you can keep it, and there really is a big asterisk. Yes. And again, not taking a position on the Affordable Care Act, but that was a tricky one because, you know, he said if you like your plan, you can keep it, and that's really not accurate. It's, it's, it's not accurate. No, not, no, nobody, none right. of us has the right to keep our plan. Right. We do live in right. a capitalist economy. Insurance companies are not required to keep insuring you year after right. year. They can discontinue your insurance. But what's most interesting to me about the way the keep your plan debate has unfolded is if people are losing their plans, it's because those plans are substandard. That's right. And so that's a message that I'm not hearing. Right. Um, they're, they're not allowed to keep their plans because uh, they may not conform to um, a, a new level of comprehensiveness uh, that's required by uh, the Affordable Care Act. And, and what's also surprising is that 
Yes, people are losing the plans that they were on. Some are having to pay more. Um, some are getting fewer benefits or better benefits. But if you add up all those people, that still does not overtake the number of folks who live in states where there's been no Medicaid expansion. Right. And so where's the outrage about that well, well, thank matter? You. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for asking that question because uh, one of the reasons I believe the, uh, the website in Washington's uh, had such a difficult time is there are so many states, so many hard-headed Republican governors and legislatures that have refused the expansion of Medicaid in their states. The federal government is picking up for the first few years uh, 100% percent of the tab. And uh, when you consider the whole state of Texas, uh, their impoverished population, their low-income population, the whole state of Florida, the um, whole state of Alabama. Um, amongst, I think Florida and Texas are number one and two in uninsured rates. That's right. right. One out of every four people in Texas is uninsured. And this was something that was remarkable to me. I was reading a study. If you compare Texas and Kentucky, mm -hmm. okay, Kentucky is one-sixth the size of Texas, and yet it tripled Texas in the number of enrollments uh, through their own... Kentucky, yeah. Kentucky, the home of Mitch McConnell, right. Senator Mitch McConnell, has had a robust um, effort uh, to enroll people through their own exchange run by Kentucky, not right. by Washington. If every state took responsibility for having their own exchange, and if every state uh, expanded their Medicaid uh, coverage, uh, we would we would really transform uh, the level of health care in our country. But let's talk about the optics of it. Are, are we at a moment in time that unless healthcare.gov starts to operate, that the entire momentum behind this law could unravel? I don't believe that's I don't believe that's the, the case. I think uh, we're seeing robust levels of enrollment here in California. Uh, we're seeing robust levels in Kentucky. In the states where it's operating, uh, uh, now, the California, Caracas, Connecticut, Minnesota, New York, Washington, I mean, these states. And another story I haven't heard a lot, this, in the states where there's a Medicaid expansion, the numbers are going gangbusters. Yes, they're going, they're, they are going gangbusters. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, the, to, I think in all fairness, I think the media, to be f truly fair and balanced, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this, this website problem and also this latest thing about the cancellations. Right. The cancellations really are about maybe 5% of the population. But it's a very small number. It's a very small it's number. It's the optics of it. 75% um, of those who have to go to the individual market are going are gonna to benefit from... Right. They're getting um, a better plan. ...better plan for lower prices and better coverages. And even those people, the 5% that are, have been canceled and are upset about the higher prices, uh, what's absolutely new about Obamacare is uh, the limited out-of-pocket expense exposure and the fact that these plans have no longer any caps on a lifetime uh, benefit or yearly benefits. Pre-existing conditions. Pre-existing conditions, uh, but just the amount of payout. Some of these plans so had a lifetime ask, uh, cap. Yeah, I mean, you represent a, a fairly um, purple area, I guess that's fair to say. It's purplish. Yeah, it's purplish. Say. And so what are your purple area saying? Well, we haven't really gotten a whole lot of angry calls. How interesting. Really. No, How we have not. Interesting. We have not. And do you know about signups in the greater Riverside area? Do you our know signups about? our signups are um, just slightly behind some of the other okay. areas in terms of, you know, you look at the de demographics or one or two points uh, behind. But are you uh, out and about talking about Cover California? I am. I'm. I'm uh, are you I'm, here? I'm, I'm, <laughs> You're I'm in the here. district, right? I'm here. I'm urging everyone right. to get uh, enrolled. I'm urging young people to sign up. Um, young people can really, with the kind of right. uh, subsidies available, can really sign up for very affordable okay. plans. His name is Mark Tacano. He is a member of the United States Congress representing Riverside and surrounding communities. My name is Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on Charter California Edition. How much did California spend to build their covered California enrollment system?
Welcome back. It's Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Virginia Blumenthal. She is the president of the Riverside Community College District. And I want to speak with you about a proposal fascinated me from the moment I read it. It's being considered by the California Community College system. The chancellor's looking at it. And it's whether community colleges should be permitted to grant four-year degrees, bachelors. I think it's a terrific idea, but let me explain. Please. I don't believe that they should be allowed to issue bachelor's degrees as the California State Universities or University of California issues them. Where I believe they are necessary, and I'll use Riverside Community Please. College District as an example, is we have one of the best nursing programs, not only in the state, but in the country. We are well equipped to offer the bachelor's degrees in nursing. And I believe if you had several areas like that, that in other words, for each community college, it would be limited to certain areas in which they have achieved a level of excellence. It's interesting you mentioned that. As you may know, in December of 2012, the state of Michigan passed a law doing exactly what you just described, allowing their community colleges to offer four-year degrees in limited areas. And so there's some precedent. Apparently, I, I just learned this through research, 21 states allow community colleges to offer, offer some form of bachelor degree. We are well equipped to offer bachelor's degrees, especially in areas of technical skills, because that's what we teach. Right. We do an awful lot of that. So the question becomes, given that there seems to be a bit of momentum behind this, how does this proposal move forward? I know that Senator Block of San Diego had proposed it a couple of years ago. It ultimately did not go anywhere. But now when you think about college costs rising, even in CSU and UC, although they may have stabilized, but be that as it may, I mean, it's still over $12,000 to go to a UC That's per correct. year. Whereas at community colleges, you know, yes, per unit rates have risen, but still very affordable in California. My suggestion would be that they would pick a pilot program. Oh like Riverside well, Community hello, College District. I mean, because we are already equipped to do just that. So, And most of our uh, uh, professors in the nursing program have either uh, already received their PhDs or are very close to getting it. And it's interesting you mention that because that begs one of the questions. You know, at community colleges, oftentimes, and this is not a negative per se, but the professor may only be a bachelor. Uh, not in terms of their marriage right. status, but their bachelor degree. And so do the professors for these four-year programs, should they be required to have advanced degrees? Absolutely. But if mm. I could correct you on Please. one area, oh, yes. is usually they have to have a master's degree oh, to true? teach in the community okay. colleges. Uh, yes. uh, thank, you for, thank you for that correction. But in the, uh, well, if we're starting to talk about issuing bachelor's degrees, then PhDs or very close to finishing a PhD, I think should be required. But you have to understand with Please. our district, we have a very large number of PhDs that are professors. How? Uh, Just, they, it's, it's your, you attract? We attract yeah. good people and they stay a long time. And while they may, we may bring them in with a master's degree, they further their education while they are there and they stay with us a long time. The flip side though is community colleges, you know, their mission, especially in California, the mission's changed a bit. I mean, it used to be the mission was kind of lifelong learning, ceramics, and conversational Spanish, and that's changed when the community colleges passed reforms last year. But be that as it may, you know, the mission is basically um, matriculation to four-year institutions and terminal degrees for those degrees that don't require four-year degrees. And so should we really consider whether it's such a mission shift that maybe we shouldn't go there? I don't think you're shifting your mission. I think you're adding to it. And I think absolutely when you are talking about a limited number of uh, potential programs that can offer those degrees, and that would be based upon the excellence level of that com particular community college. And obviously, you mentioned excellence, that would also require uh, a new accrediting regimen. It could, it could. Most of our technical programs or many of our areas are already ranked. Uh, I, I mean, see. for example, we are known for having one of the best um, nursing programs, RM programs, in the state of California. And you keep mentioning nursing, and I think it's wise when you consider that California has a dearth of nurses. I That's mean, correct. There is a shortage. An another area is a physician's assistant program, because they are now making those mandatory bachelor degrees. We are well equipped. We have one of the best uh, PA programs in the, in the country. And you mentioned PAs. I don't think people realize how 
skilled PAs really are. I mean, I have been treated by PAs having no idea they were PAs and their service was just outstanding. And our graduates have 100% employment of PAs. We have 100% passage rate of the state boards. And at the same time, when you consider that UCR Medical School has opened, it seems symbiotic that if there should be a nursing program that allows for a bachelor's, I mean, the timing couldn't be more perfect. Absolutely, absolutely it is. And not only that, but it teaches all of the people in the allied health sciences how mm. to work together. One of the areas in which we are missing for real life mm. is how doctors interact with nurses, with phlebotomists, mm. with physicians assisted. It teaches everyone how to interact with each other. Okay, you've convinced me. So, <laughs> now, I mean, it really does seem like Riverside would be a great pilot for a minimum a nursing program. That's correct. When are you flying to Sacramento? I uh, mean, it's January. Ja <laughs> I mean, but honestly, think about it. I mean, there is the symbiotic, the, th this is a moment in time where this could That's really correct. work. And what's most interesting, and I know that you personally are opposed to what I'm about to describe, but it suggests that the governor's willing to think outside of the box. As you know, the governor signed a bill that allows Long Beach City College to offer intercession courses at non-resident rates. Correct. Now, despite your op opposition, it shows that he's reform-minded. Well, and so my opposition is for intercession. My opposition uh, is not to differential funding right. or differential my, tuition. Yeah, but my point being that this is a ref it appears to be a governor that will look at out-of-the-box reforms. Yes. So yes, maybe the I timing is, is wise. Especially with opening up the new School of Medicine. Right. Uh, RCC has an excellent relationship in, in Moreno Valley College. Right. All of the, our district has an excellent relationship with right. UCR. Yeah, Norco, of course, being That's the third correct. institution. I, I want to get a sense generally about where we are today because when we were speaking last year, it was not, the, it, we were not chipper. But we, that is correct. We were not chipper. That's correct. And it just seems as if we're much more chipper these days when we talk about community colleges and just education generally in the Golden State. It, Am I misreading this? No, but the only reason we're chipper, yeah. we have to put it in perspective, okay. is because we're not cutting. Right. That does not mean we're building to go back to where we were. I understand. I would love to be there again, right. but that's going to be a long time in coming. The hits that we took were tremendous. Now, did we get rid of some of the fluff? Yes. Right. But we took draconian cuts right. in areas that we need to rebuild. Our students still can't get classes the way they should. And that's the kind of thing, I'm very pro-student. And if we really want to be the best that we can be, our students have to have access to the classes. And right now, they still don't. While it's better than what it was, right. it's not great. And at the same time, we have a governor who for better or for worse, is very focused on K-12. That's correct. He's looking at restoring funding to K-12 pre-recession levels, and so that does leave out community colleges, UC and CSU. But maybe they can come to us and not need remedial uh, classes. Right, no, your point's well taken. So with a surplus, apparently, we saw that news recently, yes. can we start seeing some more restoration in the community college level? We have already started that. Really? We have already been adding some classes, not to where we need it yet, but we are still start, we're starting to add classes and we're not making any other cuts. I want to talk to you specifically about RCC because I understand that you're in chancellor search mode. Yes, we are. I congratulate your prior chancellor who made an excellent move to Connecticut, I understand. Our people always make great moves like <laughs> Which is that. sad. You train them well and then That's they move right. on. And so for our viewers statewide, what does a chancellor search look like? The way we, we actually have a board policy on chancellor searches okay. uh, that actually uh, the board and I developed mm. once I got on the board. I see. Uh, it's a very inclusive kind of search. You have all the stakeholders at the table. You have uh, students, you have faculty, classified um, uh, and confidential right. uh, and board members that okay. are part of this search. What they do is they do the initial interviewing and they eliminate candidates that would not be a fit for right. us and they send up to the board because actually the, the chancellor is the board's only employee. And so the board uh, makes the final <laughs> choice. I hear you. Okay, we'll talk more about it. Yes. She's Virginia Blumenthal. She is the president of the Riverside Community College District. When we come back, we'll be speaking with the assistant superintendent of Riverside's Unified School District. I'm Brad Palmer. It's, it's Charter California Edition. Which state most recently allowed its community colleges to offer four-year degrees?
Welcome back to Charter California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. We are joined by Judy Pereira. She is the assistant superintendent at the Riverside Unified School District. Uh, 29 elementary schools she oversees, uh, focusing on K-6. That's correct. And I want to speak with you about a revolution in education in California, and that focuses on how the state funds education. Yes. We know that the legislature and governor recently ratified what's known as the local control funding formula whereby school districts will get a base grant, but then for those districts that have higher numbers of English language learners, foster children, or economically disadvantaged, they will see bumps. That's correct. Um, is Riverside Unified gonna see the bump per child and the concentration grant? Yes, we will. Really? Yes, we have we have the numbers to qualify right. for that. Right, so that is a nice chunk of change. Yes. But let's continue, if I may, and focus on the question of accountability. Yes. Because as part of the local control funding formula, um, almost all the categoricals were eliminated, <laughs> the strings between Sacramento and the local districts. So now? It's all in your hands. Right, that's, that's very true. It's right. a big responsibility. So let's talk about how you plan to be more accountable because you're gonna have to be. Right, so um, accountability is, is and flexibility okay, is well kind stated. of a <laughs> right. good news, bad news right. situation. Blessing and a curse. So um, you are right. The Previously the state categoricals came in and they were targeted for very specific purposes and specific children. Right. And now we'll take the money from the district level and it's it's a golden opportunity to really embrace the community in relooking at our local mm -hmm. vision, our mission, our priorities, right. and our goals for our kids. But let me ask you this: While California school districts are receiving more authority, more discretion <laughs> as a result of state law, we have something called Common Core coming yes. in, which is national standards, and so. Is there a paradox going on? You're getting more control from the state, but less from Common Core. Right. I I don't I don't think so. And, and first of all, um, somebody up at the national level, at the federal government, did yeah. not write these Common Core standards. That is true. This is not from these on were, high. These were right. educators from the various right. states. And 45 states have adopted have adopted them. those. Right. And. Um, they came with very uh, positive intent, and I think they're promising for children in their classrooms. And I will say this from what I know, they are just that, they're broad standards. Even under Common Core, aside from local control funding formula, districts need to fashion their own vision. That's true, and you can take uh, various approaches toward accomplishing the standards, but the reality that the focus behind the standards was really to better prepare our children for the changing demands right. in college and career. At the same time, <clears throat> you know, we are a very large state and with a divergent interests. And so while it's nice that school districts are getting that discretion, I, one could argue you still want kids in Riverside uh, getting the same basic framework as kids in Reading. But you can see how Reading and Riverside may come at this situation differently. Right. Um, I, I think probably the, the, the greatest consistency, and this is consistent with Common Core and interesting, the whole concept between LCAP. Mm -hmm. Which is, is local that, control accountability plan. That's mm -hmm. correct. Is that, is that the, what will stay the same is the output. So we are expected to teach all children at high levels, and we will in fact be responsible for making sure that our underserved children right. are um, graduating and performing at as high a level as other kids. Uh, uh, the difference is I, in the inputs. Right, and I do want to ask you about the whole funding formula because I don't want to suggest anything sinister, but. School districts will get more money if they have more kids qualify as English language learners or economically disadvantaged. Now, economically disadvantaged, that, that's clear. I mean, that's a clear standard mm -hmm. if they hit a certain level. English language learners, I mean, the goal is to get them off of that classification. But if you get them off of that classification, you're gonna get less money. Right. So how do you balance that? Well, 
<laughs> our goal, if I really have a goal, right. it would be to have every child end up being able to speak two languages. Well, as you and me both, I could not agree more. Our viewers know that we're raising our daughters to speak Spanish. Wonderful. And we are not we, of Latino descent, but we feel as if it's critical. Right, in because, this, yeah. because truly being an academic oh, English learner agree. is yeah. an asset, oh, not a deficit. No, well, thank you for saying that. So, I so we appreciate need to that. learn to take advantage and of that. And isn't Riverside starting some new bilingual immersion programs? You know, we have a dual language right. immersion program. Yes, right, congratulations. And in fact, our first cohort at our first school is in third grade. Oh my. And I was in their classroom oh the other day and they are all speaking it's, Spanish. It's stunning. It is they, actually stunning. They are talking completely that. in right. Spanish. It's right. very exciting. And it's expanded to three schools sure. now. Are you looking at Chinese or other languages? You know, we, we have. We oh. have actually visited some Chinese right. immersion programs. Right. There are some unique challenges uh, in, in bringing Chinese in terms of Qual highly qualified teachers, oh, right. materials, the number right. of children that you want in the sure. classroom. Okay, so aside from our love of bilingualism, let's yes. go back to the question of, you know, the, the, the kind of motivations. I mean, what do you do? What does one do to kind of get that person off of the English language learner classification, but yet not jeopardize the financial health of the district? Right. Well, my, my focus is on the kids. Okay. So, so I got it. So you know what? I, I really. Got it. I don't care if we get the money or not. If it. we accomplish the output, got it. you know, having children learn, all those children learn at high levels right. so that they are as competitive in our universities as any other child, that's really what I want to ask you a question. I know it's not in your ballywick, but I think that you can pull it off. And it deals with um, ne now 7 through 12. And it's the question of, and I've asked several educators this, and many don't know the answer, so it's okay. <laughs> it's a question about the SAT and the ACT. So, with Common Core, we are changing the way we test our children. The standardized tests are very different mm -hmm. than what they're used to. Right. Uh, it's adaptive testing. It's if you get the question right, you're going to get a harder question. If you get the question wrong, you're going to get an easier question. That's correct. Completely different. And the way we teach, completely different. Much more analytical, project-based learning. As we speak today, I do not believe the SAT organization or the ACT organization has made any pronouncements that they're going to change their test, right. which is still very bubbleized yes. and very 20th century race to the top. I, I agree with you, right? but I also recognize that both of those assessments are for different purposes. Right. The SAT is really not about testing what you've learned in the standards. Yeah, okay. It's really professed to be testing your aptitude for how successful you'll be in college. But the reality is, you know this <coughs> way more than I do, that those types of tests take a certain skill. And in a lot of ways, public school students gain that skill through 20th century, race to the top, um, no child left behind type tests. Yes. But we're going away from that. Right. And so I guess what I'm asking, and again, your case six, so I know it's not your ballywick, but is it time that educators turn to the college board and say, you need to change your test because we're not teaching kids this way? Right. I, if you're focusing on the test, right. I agree with you. If you're focusing on the kinds of thinking and learning that children are going to be required to do, I think they'll do better than ever on the SAT. Really? Because really? they are being taught how to problem solve and think critically. But and I think about the SAT words, you know, they'll say, you know, the word is ambivalent, yes. you know, and then they'll give four choices. Right. I don't know that that takes so much critical thinking. That's memorization. Well, some of it is, is factoids. Right, that, right. That is true. And, and in Common Core, there still is a body of knowledge that students will be required to learn. And there will still be a part of the test that's multiple choice. Right. But in addition to that, they're going to learn how to figure out what some of those words mean. Mm -hmm. um, a greater and a deeper academic vocabulary right. is focused on in the Common Core standards. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big part of the standards. Right, and what some have said, <clears throat> I'm just parroting, is that the, uh, Common Core goes deeper in some subjects but ignore others. I don't know if that's true. Deeper in what? Some subjects, but yet ignores others. It's yeah. very nonfiction based, to maybe to the detriment of fiction, as an example. Well, there, it, as you go up the grade levels, right. it does change. So. I have to say, Riverside is very lucky to have you. Well, thank you. You're great. I'm so glad you came. Her name is Judy Paredes. She is the Assistant Superintendent of the Riverside Unified School District. I'm Brad Pomerantz. It's Charter, California Edition.